Johnny Brian Hunt was born in rural Arkansas in 1927. He was one of seven children in a time of country churches, one-room schoolhouses, and the Great Depression. We was poor sharecroppers. You know, we got up way before daylight and worked till dark. So we worked 10, 12 hours every day, you know, six days a week. He grew up skinning logs and hauling them by horse and wagon, picking cotton, anything to make a little money. He had two older brothers, and they went to school in a one-room school. And he cried to go to school, and the teacher said, well, just let him come, too. So he started really when he was four. So in seventh grade, he was 10, and he had to quit and start working in the woods, cutting logs and cutting timber and all with his dad and his two older brothers. <coughs> Depression years and um, a large family. So he never did go back. As a teenager, Hunt worked in his uncle's sawmill, earning an adult wage of $1.50 for a 12-hour day. In 1945, Hunt joined the Army. Although he was offered a shot at officer training, Hunt returned to Heber Springs and his family. Always the hard worker, Hunt drove a lumber truck, delivered live poultry, and learned to be a fantastic lumber salesman. You know, my uncle, he couldn't read and write, but he had a big sawmill, and he'd send me off to sell lumber, and he'd just load it up and say, this is what you got on, this is how much money I want, don't come back without the money. <clears throat> well, you know, they don't teach stuff down at the university like that. <laughs> it was about that time the 21-year-old young man who couldn't read or write caught the attention of the 16-year-old John L. DeBusk, a vivacious girl with charm beauty and a devoted family. He had a drive from the time I met him. He had lots of dreams and and uh, I guess I uh, cared so much for him I knew he'd make those dreams come true and he and he really did. So I drove up there with two trailer loads of lumber and I said I, I need to sell this and he said no the gate shut can't do this can't do that and he made this terrible mistake. He asked me when I was going to get married and I said, tomorrow night, if I can get rid of this lumber. <laughs> this guy taking two loads of lumber. <clears throat> well, I would have married Sarah Knight, but she wouldn't have married me that quick. A failed attempt to start an auction business left Johnny deep in debt. So he borrowed $10 from a friend and hitchhiked to Little Rock to start over, leaving his family, his hometown, and his sweetheart behind. He bought a bunk at the YMCA for $7 and started looking for a job. JB began his career as an over-the-road truck driver. And after a five-year courtship, he and John L. were married. They spent the first 20 years of their life together raising a family, while Johnny drove a truck and ran several side businesses to earn a good living. We didn't know from one day to the next when he would be home. I've, I've experienced what it is to be at home alone and to raise children alone because um, he had to be away from home. It's really not uh, the time that they're away from home, it's how you use your time when they are home. In the late 1950s, Johnny drove a truck route that took him through Stuttgart, Arkansas, where he saw the rice hulls burning on the side of the road. Johnny knew these waste hulls would be an inexpensive material for poultry house litter, but no one could figure out a way to package the spongy, bulky hulls. Hunt was intrigued. He used his time at home to design machine specifications, making plans for a new packaging process that would later receive a U.S. patent. In 1961, the J.B. Hunt Company was incorporated. By the end of the decade, it was the largest rice hull operation in the country, earning almost a million dollars in revenue. The company prospered, but not without its hardships. Well, first year we were in business, we lost $19,000. And all the accountants and all the people that we were working with and all were saying, you'll have to close the doors, you can't go on, you've lost $19,000, you know, and you just can't keep operating. We had put everything we could beg and borrow into that company, and we just went back to Canada day one and started over. Well, so we felt like we have to make this work. We just kept going. We just kept working. Like most of JB's business ventures, his transport service began as a sideline. In 1969, a rice hull customer encouraged Johnny to purchase a refrigerated transportation company. He said, JB, I want you to buy the truck line. I said, well, Red, I haven't got any money. And he had five old trucks and seven 
wore out reefer trailer. So we wind up making a deal and then Ralston gave us the contract and that's where we started the trucking business. The Hunts relocated to Northwest Arkansas and focused efforts on the trucking business. Rates were regulated and you could only haul a customer's freight if you secured legal authority. The business was brutal. And it was before deregulation and it was a challenge. It was not easy. I would stay awake at night and try to figure out how to get money from someone. It, calling at five o'clock in the morning and hanging up on me and me calling back three times, you know, to get their home phone number and call them at home at night. I had no limits in what I would try to collect the money because it was that desperate. The Rice Hole Company actually had to keep that trucking company going for about the first 10 years. You know, there, there were some times when Mrs. Hunt personally dispatched me to customer's offices to collect money. So I would go and I would have some really difficult conversations with some customers about why we weren't being paid. But guess what? I always got the check. And she said, I knew you could do that. <laughs> She'd say, Tom, don't ever be ashamed to ask somebody to pay us. We did the work. Financial support from the Rice Hall Company, a president with more than 20 years of industry experience and great partnerships, were not enough to make a startup trucking company a success in the 1970s. More than once, they discussed dropping the truck line. The early days was lots of hard work, lots of hours. We had a load board. It was a magnetic board where people would write the loads up. There was a camera on that board that was in Mr. Hunt's office. Every once in a while, you would hear this voice come over the intercom system up there and say, how many loads today? 1973 brought fresh energy and promise to the startup enterprise. The company added many talented young people who were intelligent, energetic, and willing to work very hard. That year, 19-year-old Kirk Thompson began working in the accounting department. Another future leader arrived on the scene, Wayne Garrison, a former manager of the successful Stuttgart Rice Hall Mill, joined the trucking operation. The management team took an aggressive approach to growth. They fought for the authority to haul lucrative freight. Wayne Garrison had the ability to create and execute a plan. He brought reason and strategy to JB's entrepreneurial musings. And in 1979, the organization made serious changes to improve profitability. Their approach shattered the mold for truckload carriers of the day. They standardized the fleet with fuel-efficient, smaller engines and improved fuel mileage, fleet efficiency, and utilization. They chose to slow down their truck speed, a pioneering move at the time. Innovation, originality are foundational to the very beginning of the company. Uh, think about the idea that we built a fleet on a very standardized piece of equipment that was interchangeable, had the same parts, the same mechanical needs. Basically, a driver could get in one and couldn't know the difference between the next one. We put drivers in uniforms. We asked them to present almost a military-like presence. Very original at the time. Starting tonight, don't let another truck leave this lot until the guy has got hard toe shoes on, t-shirts off, I want a collar on, I want him shaved, I want his hair cut. I said, otherwise you just leave the truck on the lot. So many drivers got their hair cut here and shaved, it stopped the entire sewer system up. Did you know this company started making money and has made money every month since that, that day and become from the sorriest truck line to the best in the nation. Historically, we'd had the Interstate Commerce Commission that basically told us where we could go and provide service and what we could charge. And with deregulation, that was up to us. Now we could charge anything and go anywhere. And we took advantage of that and we excelled in that environment. And we became the trucking company that everybody wanted to be. So we had this, this fantastic company of uh, drivers in uniform, brand new equipment, it was clean, it was shiny, we had impeccable service, and we had the best operating ratio, and we were the most profitable guy in the industry. Uh, to Mr. Hunt, there was really no second place. There was only one place. You had to be the biggest, you had to be the best, uh, you had to be the leader. And as the company swelled to more than 500 and then 1,000 people, Johnny would still start his day the same way he had from the very beginning. 
he would come in, and before he ever came upstairs to his office, he would start, and he would start on the lower floor where the computers were and all. And he would go to every person in there, and he would speak to everyone. He'd walk in, he'd have the, the jacket and the tie and the cowboy hat on, and before he ever even went in his office, he'd start going up and down the aisles of the company. That happened basically every morning. He would come by each of us, pat us on the back. He would ask us how business was. He would commonly refer that we were on the ground floor and it's big and we're going places. And he said it was with such conviction and such enthusiasm. Even though it was a small office, there was a lot of energy there. I can remember Mr. Hunt would bring customers through the office and, and he would say, this is the building with the most walnut paneling in the whole world. And I don't know if it was true or not, but he had a story because in his mind, big things happened there, and that's how he would sell it. This high back seat better than that low back seat we used to have? Oh, I love it. It's a whole lot better. Uh, you got more shoulders. Johnny's vision more. was infectious, and his experience as a driver was a distinct advantage. His insight combined with industry wisdom charmed both employees and customers. He cared deeply about each driver's personal and professional success, and he coached the drivers on matters of finance their first day on the job. How many in this room is flat broke? How many is bent bad? Well, let me tell you something. If you're flat broke, you're in the best room that I know of in the entire United States. You know, 25 years ago, well, let's say about 27 years ago, I was over at Ball Knob, Arkansas one night. I'd been driving this old truck all night, and when I went into the restaurant, I came out, and you only had the big old neon signs going on and off, and when I did, there sat a Coupe de Ville Cadillac. And man, I walked around that thing, and it was polished, and with a mosquito lid on it, it slipped and broke its neck, and I told myself that day, I want me one of those things. So I saw something I wanted so bad that I would quit throwing any money away to get that Cadillac. If Johnny was the dreamer, Kirk Thompson was the moneymaker, always discerning and continually motivating his people to action. Wayne Garrison was the disciplinarian, watchful over the enterprise, providing strategy, and continually seeking excellence. Together, Wayne and Kirk led the team through a new era of growth and profitability. They took a hard look at the details, trimming away what wasn't working. Uh, when I started with our company, both Wayne Garrison and Kirk Thompson were in their early 30s. Uh, the entire group was very young. They were hungry, they were innovative, they were creative, they were very demanding. But at the same point in time, they were looking out for the best interest of the company, how we could grow, how we could improve each day. And I think they genuinely wanted good things to happen for all of our people. That initial management team deserves the credit for the success this company has had and where we're at today. It really all happened in 1983. That was the year we went public, and you realize how much money and capital by going public it created in this organization that allowed us to grow and buy equipment and invest. I think our growth rate in the 80s was around 3,800%. Uh, it didn't take long to figure out that this company was as well run and well managed as, as any that we had seen, particularly in the truckload only business. I think the thing that most impressed us was the fact that, that John L. Hunt was involved with this company. You know, Mr. Hunt was a dreamer, and he would tell you that. And Mrs. Hunt was no doubt his biggest fan. And that's why they made a great team. Mr. Hunt came up with the ideas. Some might have been wild and crazy and Mrs. Hunt always added that little dose of reality and I think that's what made it work so well. They were so together with this business that the J in J.B. Hunt could actually stand for John L. Growth was real important and a sense of ingenuity and we found ourselves uh, looking at things quickly. I used to tell him, I'd say, there's an imaginary sign outside this building. I said, none of us can see it, but the people passing by can because it says, if you have a crazy idea, come here, there's a man that'll listen to you. By the end of the 1980s, the struggling company that began with five old tractors had grown to be a half billion dollar company. In 1990, industry magazines called J.B. Hunt the nation's largest truckload carrier. 
Mr. Hunt stepped away as president of the company in 1982 and remained chairman of the board until 1995. Although it was the end of Mr. Hunt's time with the company, it was just the beginning for J.B. Hunt Transport. On the horizon was something even bigger. Service abroad to Canada and Mexico, logistics and dedicated capabilities, an unlikely partnership with the railroads, and the return of a management team that would instill the importance of discipline and financial wisdom. Built on big dreams, impeccable ethics, and hard work, J.B. Hunt created a solid foundation, prepared for the new century and beyond.